Welcome to Rivers United Church Online. For those of you I haven't met, my name is John Hunter. I'm the lead pastor. I want to take a moment to personally welcome you. For those of you that have been with us a long time, we want to say we're so glad you're with us as well. I do want to tell you something exciting that's coming up. In fact, it is the most exciting Sunday that there is, not only for our church, but every church. As next Sunday, we celebrate Easter celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can't think of anything more exciting, but especially at Rivers United Church. Last year, because of the pandemic and all of that, we were not able to have in-person services. This year we are. We're having two services. Both of them will have a kids ministry in them. It is one of the best Sundays of the year. If you've never been to us and you're thinking about coming, you this would be the perfect opportunity to come and attend. If you said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about coming, please come next Sunday because it is the perfect chance to be able to do that. If you're thinking about inviting somebody, please, next Sunday would be the best Sunday to invite somebody. We have some amazing things going on with our kids. So if you have kids or you know somebody with kids or you got grandkids, please bring them next Sunday as we're going to share something really exciting about what we're doing in our kids' ministry. And so next Sunday is an amazing time to do that. We're also starting a brand new series next week called But God Changes Everything. So I know some of you guys have been praying about inviting people. I really appreciate that. Keep doing it. Invite some people this week because I got to tell you, it's going to be one of the most spectacular Sundays that there is. It's going to be life-changing. Can't wait to do it. Hope you're going to be part of it. I do want to say this. If you're not able to come in person, that's okay. We're still having church online. In fact, we're going to have a special gift, not only for the people that are attending in-person services, but you guys that are attending online church next Sunday, we have a special gift for you too. So don't miss out next Sunday, Easter Sunday. It's going to be amazing. And we're praying for that. Thank you guys so much. You might be wondering if that's what's happening next Sunday, then Why would I want to be here today? Because here's the thing. You could not have picked a better time to be with us today, as today we're wrapping up a series called Ridiculous Faith. Now, if you haven't been with us the whole time, that's okay, because these messages are posted on our YouTube channel and our website. You can binge watch them if you want to, but we have saved the best for last. Um, We've been covering the life of an incredible prophet in the Bible named Elisha. And when we use the term ridiculous faith, sometimes I think people wonder, it's like, that's a weird thing to say. Two words that really don't seem to go together. Faith seems to be a good thing, and ridiculous doesn't. But here's what I know. Normal things, right? The normal way we do things in our life is broken. If they weren't, we wouldn't try something new. We wouldn't need to have faith, right? So sometimes the things that God is asking us to do, the things that this great prophet that we've been studying did, they seem ridiculous, but yet... They work out in a way that never happened before. That it's life-changing. It's, it's mind-changing. It's ridiculous faith. I covered a lot of things in this series. In fact, here's some of the ridiculous things that he did. It might make you want to go and watch them. We'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more as we get into it today. But, but, but a couple of the things he did was is some, some, the army of Israel and Judah and Edom came to him and, and said, we need water for our troops. They're getting ready to go into battle and, and there's no water, and we need water. And he said, I need you to go dig a ditch. But sometimes you have to dig a ditch. That's one of the things that happened. Uh, that he burnt plows. That he, that, he, that he asked the lady to bring him all kinds of jars. Um, there was just so many things in this series. Now, we in no way have covered an extensive portion of Elisha's life. We've covered some really important pieces, but, but we have not, we've missed a lot of things. I want to share with you just a couple other things that happened in his life, some miracles. That he raised the dead. It, it, He healed a leper, which is a deadly disease, if you've never heard of it, that he healed a leper. He blinded an army, that the army was coming against Israel and Judah, and and he blinded it, and and the angels helped him and fought that battle for them. (laughs) If you want to read more about the life of Elisha, there's two places I'd recommend. First is just read your Bible. It's found in the book through 1 Kings chapter 19. Through the book of 2 Kings, you can read about the story of Elisha. Mid, midway through the book of Second Kings. The other book I would recommend is this. It's a book called Greater by Steve Furtick. He's the pastor of Elevation Church, one of the fastest growing churches in America. I've loved watching Steve Furtick, but I read his book a couple years ago, and it really impacted me. I use it as a Bible study, and if you're looking for a Bible study to do, the book Greater would be a great book to use. Um, so there's so much in his life, and, and I hope, in fact, I, I won't just hope, we're going to come back to Elisha more in the future. But as we wrap up today, I want to wrap up with a question for us to ask ourselves. 
And whether this is your first time or you've been here the whole series, I, I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you lost your edge? You know what I mean by that? Every time I hear that phrase, I always think of when Apollo Creed asked Rocky in the movie Rocky, for those of you who remember that, he said, you've lost your edge. You've lost the eye of the tiger. <laughs> it's one of my favorite quotes. But my question for you is this. Have you lost yours? How have you lost your edge? Or have you? You see, it's easy to misplace things sometimes. Sometimes we don't remember where we lost them, but, but it's but it's easy to lose things. I know for me it is um, physical things. I lose them very easily. <laughs> and I think about that. Uh, a couple of things that I've lost, my keys, I, I, sometimes I can't find them. You can ask my wife or my son, I'm, I'm constantly losing them. Or my phone, you know, where did I put my phone? I can't find it, right? Sometimes I had to replace my phone because of it. And, and one other thing that I've lost that's been kind of weird is, is my wedding ring. Now, I got one now, um, and I actually have two because somebody felt bad for me and, and they gave me one, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Jack Jennings, when he passed away, his wife allowed me to have his, and he was one of the most decorated military people in the state of Virginia. And I just want to say, if she's watching Linda Jennings, I still have Jack's ring. I just like the silver one because it matches my hair. So anyway, that's a whole different thing. But and I've lost some along the way. Um, the first one, I think it was Marie's fault, my wife, because we were spending the night somewhere, and I gave it to her to put on a nightstand. She says that didn't happen. So anyway, she's not here to defend herself, so that happened, and, and we lost it. The second one I lost. We were down at the beach. It was We were celebrating uh, the first of the year, and I had in my hands – some sand, and I was throwing it at Marie because <laughs> she threw some at me. And uh, we were just having a sand fight, something that we usually do. And, and I threw my ring right off, and I, and I lost something that was incredibly valuable to me. And, and, and it hurt because it was, it was a very expensive ring, but it wasn't just the price. It was what it represented. And we went back the next day with a metal detector and tried to find it and couldn't. And it was just, a, it was just really hard to lose something like that. Let me ask you a question. Have you lost your edge, not just physical stuff, but have you lost your edge? You know what I mean by that? Spiritually or emotionally or psychologically, your joy, your motivation, your enthusiasm, that somewhere along the line, it has, you've lost it. And the question I have today is this, is how have you lost it? What have you lost, but, but how have you lost it? And we're going to kind of explore that as you, as you look at that question. I want you to Look through the lens of that question as we explore this in the last lesson we have on Elisha. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 6 is where we want to talk today. It says this, The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we are meeting you is too small for us. <laughs> I'll pause here and just say, Elisha was a great prophet. Because not only was he a prophet, he had a company of prophets. It means that young guys came to him that had the gift of prophecy, and they wanted to learn from the great man. And this tells you how good it was. And not only that, but as they met, they outgrew the small space that they're in. It reminds me a lot of almost where we're at as a ministry right now ourselves. Uh, verse 2 says this, Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, go. Can I pause here and say, Elisha was a great leader. One of the things about leadership is this, this is kind of a side note, is that with his leadership, you know what he did? He empowered them to do it. He didn't just say, hey, the great prophet didn't have the idea, so it must not be good. He said, it's a great idea, and he's willing to listen to other people's ideas, but not only that, but also empower them to do it. All right, let's look what happens next. Verse three, then one of them said, then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? And he said, I will, Elisha replied. Can I tell you something about him? He's this incredible man of God, and he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. That's great leadership. Now, he's not afraid to get in there and try. Now, some people look at me and they go, John, are you afraid to get your hands dirty? And the answer is no, no absolutely not. I've been a church planner, and, and I've done a lot of those things myself. I'm not the great man of God, but but I am a person that has, has had to do almost everything, including clean the church and all that, and I still do, and I'm happy to do it. But I don't have a lot of technical skills, so sometimes people say, hey, how come you don't do this construction thing? I'm there. I can help you break down things, but I can't do some of those skills. But here's what I want to tell you today. Never think a job is beneath you. That's what this guy did. He went and helped even this old man. It's a, it's a great illustration. 
a side note, but, but a very good one. Verse 4. And he went down with them, and they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. So they needed trees to cut down. You kind of get the picture. And then verse 5 says this. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, no, my Lord, he cried out. It is borrowed. If I could ask you to circle something today, I would say cried out. Can I tell you why he cried out? Because you might be thinking, hey, he lost the axe head. How big of a deal is that? It's a huge deal, especially in their time, because iron was incredibly rare and it was expensive. And to have somebody actually manage it and do it in ancient times, meaning that, that they would manipulate it or, or create it and, and have the gift to be able to make an axe head and get one, it was something very expensive you'd get from a rich person. And that's what he did. He borrowed it. They didn't have enough money to pay back. So he's in trouble. It was borrowed. Some of you, that might be where you feel like, right? You feel stretched. And we're going to talk to you today. But the first thing is this. He cried out. That's important. He needed help. I got a feeling there's somebody there today. You, you, you need to cry out. What's going on in your life? How, how have you lost your edge? Quite honestly, we're talking about a real edge here, right? He lost a real edge, the axe head. Okay, verse 6. The man of God asked, where did it fall? Can I tell you something? Sometimes I'm a little bit uh, uh, annoyed by that question, right? It's like, if I knew where I lost it, right? Somebody says, hey, where did you lose your keys, John? Where did you lose your, <laughs> your phone, John? Where's the last place you had it? I was like, if I knew that, I, you, I wouldn't have to, right? If I knew that, I, I would have already found it, right? I don't know. Anyway, that's just, that's just something else. But, but here, what he's talking about is this, is take me to the place where it fell. W where did you lose your edge? Can, can you can you can, can you underline that? Where where did you lose your edge? Hmm. And then he says, then he does this. It says Elisha cut a stick. He cut a stick and he threw it in there and he made the iron float. <laughs> Is that weird? The iron, the axe head, floated up to the surface. He he threw something in, and then it floated. Now. This is not a technique that you learn. This is a miracle that happened. It almost seems ridiculous, but yet God did it. Ridiculous faith. He had faith in God. He cried out. He said, where did it fall? The man of God came over. The axe head floated. But I want you to see the next part because this is interesting. He said, he said, lift it out, he said. And then the man reached in and took it out. He got his axe head back. That's the end of the story. You might be going... That's where you want to wrap this story up? <laughs> this is where you want to wrap this series up? Are you sure this is where you want to go? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Because here's what I know. Some of us have lost our edge. And this story is a metaphor. Maybe you didn't know I knew big words like that. Metaphorical. <laughs> about our life. That we have to cry out to God. To do what only God can do. And that God wants to use this as a pattern to help us get our edge back. If you've lost your edge, today we're going to help you get it back. I want to share with you two things. Two things to get your edge back. Two things to get your edge back from this story. Number one, number one, be honest about where you lost it. Be honest about where you lost it. You know the first question he asked? Where did it fall? You know what I think God's asking you today? Where did it fall? You see, some of us are struggling. Some of us have felt the pain. We felt that, you know what, our life has become dry. It's become unmotivated. And some of us don't really realize where we lost it. It's just like me with my ring and my keys and, and my, my phone. I, I didn't mean to lose it, but I did. And I have to kind of come back to saying, i got to be honest about where did I lose that in my life? On the things that are big, my joy and my enthusiasm and my, my serving, where, where, did it, where, where did I lose it? Be honest about it. Let me ask you a question. Where have you lost it? Sometimes people lose it. I wrote down a few things just, just to do it. it. It didn't mean that these things started off bad, but they started to rob us of our joy. Some people, you started a relationship. 
You got into a relationship, and it started off well, and then it got toxic, and you haven't been paying attention, but yet it's bringing you down. Somebody, you, you stopped doing something that you once did. Maybe your schedule changed or, or it's just a different phase of life or somehow you just got out of the habit of doing a practice, a discipline that was really good for you. You, you used to read your Bible, but then you kind of stopped. You, you used to pray. You had a regular time of prayer, but, but you stopped. And now it's starting to show up and you didn't know why. You didn't know why your life has gotten away. You used to go to small group. You used to go to community group. And then maybe it stopped meeting and, and then you just got out of the habit. Or maybe it's during COVID and went online and you just go, ah, I just can't do that anymore. And, and you kind of lost the connection with the kids. Or, or maybe during the time of church merger, you went, hey, you know what? It's so weird with two churches merging together and it's different than it used to be. And then the pandemic hit and I just got out of the habit of coming all together. And you just happen to be watching it today and you've lost your edge. And today you're, you're figuring out why, but it's because you dropped a habit. You didn't mean to lose it, but you did. I wrote down another one. Sometimes it's a secret that you're keeping. You picked up something. Instead of dropping a habit that was good, you picked up one that was bad, right? You started to smoke again. Or maybe you started smoking for the first time. You didn't mean to, right? Or you started overeating or you stopped exercising. Or you started drinking. And you can't control it. And it just keeps getting out of control. And you, you're hiding it but, it, but it's causing problems in your life or, or drugs. If you're there, we want to be able to help you. But, but here's, here's the thing that it takes. You have to be honest about where you lost it. Somebody, it, it's not that you're doing something wrong. It's that somebody did something wrong to you. Hmm. And bitterness has set into your life and it's affecting you. It's coming out. You think you can bury it, but, it, but it's coming out. Maybe, maybe it was church that, that kind of offended you, and what happened was is you went, hey, I was serving there, and then something changed, or somebody said something, or somebody said something that was really hurtful, and you stopped serving. You said, I'm out. I got my feelings hurt, and I'm done. Maybe you didn't even think of it that way, and you don't really know why, but you just got out of the habit, and you've lost your edge. Number one, you got to be honest about where you lost it. You didn't mean to, but you did, but the first place you got to start is this, admit it. Be honest about it. I've lost it, and I think I changed these things. The second one is this. If you want to get your edge back, number two, with God's help, take it back. With God's help, take back what you lost. Lift it out. That's what he said. He looked at the guy, and, and, and God caused it to float, right? He couldn't do that. And then he said, but, but here's the thing. God didn't pull it out of the water for him, right? The man of God, the Elisha, didn't pull it out of the water for him. He said, you have to lift it out. Now, let me explain something. This, this man could not make that axe head float. God did for him what only God can do. That was a miracle. But can I tell you something? God did the miracle, but he wanted him to lift it out. In this, this story of Elisha, we studied a couple weeks ago, that, that what happened, that, that, that some men came to him from Judah and, and, and the king, and we kind of mentioned that, that they, that they needed water, and he said, you know what you need to do? Go out and dig a ditch. That's what captures the water. Oh, God provides the water. Only God can bring the water, but sometimes he wants us to dig a ditch. That's what we learned in this series. Last week, there was a widow lady that came to him, and I was almost appalled. I almost didn't know if I wanted to share this story because, because of what he said to her. He came to him and said, I, I have, my husband has died. He was a man of God, and now the creditors are coming, and they want to take my boys as slaves. And he asked her, what do you have? I couldn't believe he asked that, right? And she said, just a little jar of olive oil. That's all he had. And God increased that olive oil, and it poured and poured and poured. But here's the thing. Even though God provided it, you know what he said? I want you to go out and bring the jars. He, she went out and got as many jars as she could, and she poured and poured and poured and it didn't run out. Can I tell you what I think it means for us today? That God, that God wants to do an amazing work in your life, but he wants you to lift it out. He wants you to take it back. He'll do for you what you cannot do for yourself, but he wants you to lift it back. So here's the thing I know. 
Somebody here today, you're going, I want God's blessing on my life. Somebody here, you go, I want to get it back. I want God's blessing back. But here's the thing you got to understand. God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. But your part's going to take effort. We lost it along the way. In fact, I wrote down a verse I just want to read for you. It's, it's Revelation chapter 2. He's challenging several ch- churches in the book of Revelation. And, and he says this in Revelation 2 verse 4. He's talking to a church that went through some extraordinary things, some extraordinary hard things. And he said, you have forsaken the love you first, that you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did it first. I got to tell you, when I hear the word repent, it kind of brings up some connotations of somebody screaming at me and hitting repent. That's not what it means, though. Now, I want to explain that to you today. I got a feeling somebody that you're listening right now, and you don't need somebody to be harsh with you right now. And when you hear a word like repent, you're thinking it's angry, and it's not. God is saying, you know what it means? It means change directions. It means you didn't mean to lose it, but you did. And he's saying, now that you know, change directions. You see, it's not enough just to know where you lost it. You need to lift it out. That God will cause the axe head to float. But you have to bring it up out of the water. You have to take your effort and and, and bring it out. And he tells that church to go back and do the things that they first did. You know what I think a lot of people have done? You got off track. Whether it's you did something wrong or somebody did something wrong to you, You've lost your edge. You stopped serving. You stopped relating to God. And and you've gotten way off track. And you know what he's telling you? He's saying, come back. Do the things you first did. You know, when somebody wants to, when they say they have marriage problems, in fact, we had a series a couple of weeks ago called What's Love Got to Do With It? And we wrapped it up a couple weeks ago. And, and we talked a little bit about saying, hey, you know, what the, you know what the problem is in marriage? It's not that we don't still have love for each other. It's that we get comfortable with each other, right? And over time, we stop doing the things we first did, and we get comfortable, but yet we lose our excitement and enthusiasm. It doesn't mean we can't get it back, but it means that this time, it doesn't just happen spontaneously, right? It happens intentionally. That we have to create those environments. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 5, 8, or I'm sorry, Psalms 5, 8, I believe I wrote that down. Psalm, or I'm sorry, Proverbs 5.18. <laughs> I shouldn't go by memory. <laughs> Proverbs 5.18, in the book of wisdom, you know what it says? It says, remember the wife of your youth. You know what it means? If you want to be happy, you know what you got to do? You got to go back and do the things you first did. But today, we're not just talking about marriage. We're talking about your life. And if you want to get your edge back, then where did you lose it? And what do you have to do that you've stopped doing? You see, I think one of the issues that we're facing, and somebody is is probably dealing with this, is that next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and I told you about that, and I'm so excited about it, but this has to come first for some of us because we're talking about inviting people and serving, and somebody's out there today, and you have been serving and serving and serving, and you're burned out, and maybe you've been there for a while. You're hurt, and, and you keep serving beyond beyond yourself. And I think what God's trying to tell you today is this, is just stop just for a minute. That you don't just need to give it out, you need to be able to take it in. I just feel that that God wants you to know that today. I remember a great pastor saying this, is that he said this, the way I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. As a pastor, I've watched several other pastors that have struggled, including myself. Some of them have struggled with marital unfaithfulness or using money in a wrong way or doing all kinds of things that we would go, how could they possibly do that? Or some of them have even gotten so depressed and almost suicidal. And we go, how could this incredible man of God that, that shares the word of God every week, in fact, I mean, they share it 10 times better than I could ever share. And I've watched these guys. I looked up to these guys. And in some ways I still do, but they got off track. And we go, how could that happen? I can tell you, because they stopped taking the word of God in. They got very good at sharing the word of God. They got very good at displaying it and, and, and being able to present it and give it out. But they stopped taking it in. 
And the way they were doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in them. They, they were a full-time pastor. In fact, some of them, it, it, it was more than full-time, and I totally understand. But they were a part-time follower. You know what? God's been showing me that as well to say, John, don't, don't think it's just about doing. You've got to have a relationship with me. Somebody, you needed to hear that today. That you need to pause Maybe it's not something you need to do. It's a relationship you need to have with God. That you need to necessarily stop doing so much for God and start experiencing God. And then when he fills you, you'll have more that you can be able to give out. He'll be more than enough, but, but don't try to do it without him. Where did you lose it? And then you got to lift it back out. you got to go back and start doing the things you first did. Repent and come back to God. There's one other person I want to talk to today, and that's this. Somebody, you go, man, I, I'm too far gone, right? Maybe, maybe you had an episode like I just talked about, and, and, it, and, it, and you started doing some really stuff that was so bad that you go, I don't think I can come back. I don't think God could ever forgive me for the things that I've done, or, or maybe people have hurt you so bad that you go, I just don't think I'm going to sign up to be hurt again. It, it can go on both sides of this equation. But I want to tell you something today. I want to make sure you hear this because i got a feeling this is the work that God wants to do. And I especially think he wants to do it before we invite people to Easter, before we try to help somebody else. Can I tell you what I think he's saying? He can give it back. He can give you your edge back. I'll give you a verse that you can look up later for yourself. The prophet Joel in the Bible, Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, they had went through some incredible plagues, including a time that the locusts came and ate all of their, their crops, and, and, and the country was in a time of famine. And it says this, the Lord said to them, so I will restore you the years that the swarms of locusts have eaten. I will give you back the, I will give you back the years. I will prosper you again. I will give you back everything you lost. You don't think God could do that for you, but he can there's ever a time that I, I read about, and, and I spent a lot of time there when I was going through a difficult time in my life, the book of Job, where Job lost everything that he had. It was so hard. He lost family members. He lost his, some of his kids died. And, and he went through all kinds of physical and health problems. I got to tell you, you read it. it <laughs> the first 30 chapters of the book of Job will depress you. But by the end, you know what you'll learn? That God gave him all this stuff back, but there was something more important than just the stuff that he gave. In fact, he says that he gave him double the portion back. You know what was more important? He also had God. I think there's somebody that needs to hear that today. My question for you today is this, is how have you lost your edge? And if you want to know how to get it back, you got to be honest about where you lost it. And with God's help, you can take it back. In a minute, I'm going to pray, and I hope that you'll pray with me. And maybe for the first time, you can invite God into your life, if you've never done that before. Maybe you're going, I've never even had the edge. Then today is the day you could receive him. Somebody here today, you're going, I had it, and I lost it, and I don't think I could ever get it back, but I'm going to tell you something. If God could do it for Elisha, he can do it for you. If God could do it for all these men in the Bible, he can do it for you. If God can say it in the book of Joel, he can do it for you. If he can do it for the nation of Israel, he can do it for you. And if God could do it in the life of Job, he can do it for you. Let me tell you something. If God could do it for me, he can do it for you. And let me tell you something. God can do it again. Be honest about where you lost it. And let God help you take it back. Before we pray, I want to share one more thing. When God does restore that for you, when God gives you in just a moment, I got a feeling when you pray, it's, you're, you're going to feel him, maybe even for the first time. Then here's what I want to tell you. Next Sunday, if that happens for you, I want you to come back. Whether it be online or you come in person, I want you to be part of what we're going to do as we start a brand new series called But God Changes Everything. It's going to help you in this journey. The other thing is this. If he's doing it for you, bring somebody along with you. Because let me tell you something, there is nothing like sharing it with somebody else. We oftentimes think, oh no, I can't share it because I struggle. But let me tell you something, you know what's going to get you out of, of that slump? You know what the biggest thing we need to do is help other people 
It's not just about us getting it ourselves, but help other people. So I pray, I, I pray two things, that you will be here Easter, whether it be in person or online, and two, that you will invite somebody to come with you. And let me tell you something, I think God's going to take you to a whole new place. Can I pray for us today? Let's pray. Father God, I come before you today, and Lord, I pray for each person that's listening and taking the time to be here. I thank you for that time, and I don't believe your word ever returns void. Mine might, (laughs) but today it's not about me, God. It's about your word. And you've taken this story that's so simple and a little bit weird, but you've constructed it in such a way that it's a metaphor for our life. And our lives are not simple, but they are weird sometimes. And I'm praying for the person today, God, that's lost their edge that you will help them get it back. That God, I believe with all my heart, you're already doing for them what they cannot do for themselves. But I pray today, God, help them to know that with your help, they can take it back. That they will do the small acts that it takes to to bring their edge back, to, to get their joy back, to get their peace back, to get their excitement back. Lord, somebody out there, they've been hurt by somebody else, and I pray that they can help Lord, help them realize that the same blood of Jesus that covered their sins is the same blood of Jesus that can help them forgive. Lord, I pray for the one that's so guilty. That goes, God could never forgive me for the things that I've done. That you say, just like you did to Israel that were so far from you, that you will give them back the years that the locusts have destroyed. That they think, I, I, I couldn't have a life again, but yet with God's help, Lord, if you could resurrect your one and only son, Jesus, You could resurrect our life. That's what it means. God, I pray they know that today. They need prayer. Lord, I pray they reach out to us and we can do this as a church, not a a place where they're going to be met with judgment, but a church, Lord, that would reach out to them and say, hey, you know what? We've all been there, right? And we can get there together as we start to follow you. Lord, make us that kind of church. Next Sunday, Lord, is Easter. I pray we have all kinds of people that come. Lord, I pray that we'll invite our friends, the one lost person that needs to come, But before we go there, Lord, I pray that we don't allow the work of God, the work we're doing for you to destroy the work in us, that we have the relationship with you. And from that overflow, we share it with other people. Lord, make us those kind of people. Make us that kind of church. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.